Thank you, Sky. What a perfect song for the theme we've been having this month, huh? And Sky and I have known each other for a long time now. Um, and his first book is out, and he's got them available to sell, but I want you to know it's called Living in Flow. Sky is not only a musician, he's also a physicist. Interesting combo, right? And so um, Sky has written this book that's just been released, Living in Flow, The Science of Synchronicity and How Your Choices Shape the World. So this is, uh, um, he's working on proving in physics uh, how the creative law works, basically, you know, in our lives. And uh, so that's pretty fun. So this is the um, reflection of that work that isn't finished yet, but is in progress. And it's really informative and interesting and in human terms, you know. It's not written in physicist. So I just want to acknowledge him for this. It's very exciting. And you'll be able to pick it up over there at the uh, table after the service. Can I invite folks to my upcoming Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do that now. Friday at 7 p.m. on March, what? 15th at Book Passage. Passages. Book Passages? Whatever it is, you guys know. So good morning, and welcome to the Golden Gate Center for Spiritual Living. I'm Reverend Mary Murray Shelton. I'm the senior minister here, and I am thrilled and delighted to welcome you uh, on this kind of iffy morning to a wonderful service. Our welcome team is going to come forward here in just a minute to a specific, no, no, come ahead, don't wait, to specifically welcome those of you who are here with us for the first time this morning. I want to tell you a couple of things. Um, one is that these folks are going to bring you a welcome packet that's got this blue card in it that says welcome. That's how you know. If you fill this out, take it to the welcome table over here, the membership table, and turn it in. They are going to give you a gift, which is this little book called Nourishing Thoughts. And it is bite-sized bits of metaphysical nourishment for all the challenges and ups and downs in your life. So turn in your card, get a little book, and let us welcome you. And the first welcome, the first wave of welcome beyond this little message from me is that they're going to bring you a packet of information about us so you can get your blue card. So give us a wave so that they can bring that to you. Those of you who are here for the very first time, be brave. We, I promise we won't follow you home. That, that, <laughs> nourishing thoughts. Thanks, Guy. Thanks for the plug. Okay, great. If you're, uh, if you're here for the second time and you didn't have the courage before, give them a wave and they'll bring you a... Or even the third time. Okay? Thanks. I uh, also want to let you know that our donation envelopes now are out on the education events and PowerPoint tables. The donation envelopes also come with... Uh, there are two different donation slips. One's for cash and checks. The other is for credit cards. So if you're putting your donation in an envelope, make sure you get the right one with it. And that'll allow us to know what we're doing over there. And also, the Science of Mind magazine is available from CC for March now over at the AV table. Okay. Very good. So now we're at the end of February. Our theme for this month has been oneness and seeking the common good and kind of discovering what what is that common good and I wanted to ask us this question am I my brother's keeper really like isn't isn't my brother or my sister or my mother or my friend aren't they responsible for themselves why do I need to be responsible for them well I want to tell you um, this little story a man's dad passed away but the guy was very important and very busy, and he didn't feel like he had the time to go back to his dad's funeral. So he called his brother on the phone, and he said, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be able to come to the funeral, so if you'll arrange everything for dad, first class, take care of the service, the burial, all the details, and I'll pay for everything. So his brother said, okay. And a couple of weeks after the funeral, the older brother got a note from his brother along with the receipts and an invoice for the funeral costs, which were a few thousand dollars, and he paid the bill. And then a month later, another invoice came from his brother for $400, which he paid. And a month after that, he got another bill from his brother for $400, and that seemed strange. So 
although he went ahead and paid it, when he got another one the next month, he called his brother. And he was confused. And he said, what are these invoices that I keep receiving every month for $400? And his brother said, well, you said you wanted everything first class for the funeral. So I rented dad a tuxedo. <laughs> Subtle message underneath there for the older brother, I think, you know. Um, you couldn't be bothered to take care of your dad while he was alive, so you get to take care of him now. Um, when we look at our connection with the other people in our lives, it's interesting to me to discover how resilient they can be and how fragile they can be at the same time. It can take years to build a wonderful friendship, relationship, and one comment or one lack of response at a critical moment, and suddenly that relationship is at an end. Have you ever had that experience? It just is over. Um, and so I recognize that although we do have resilience and there is forgiveness in our relationships, that also we have a certain responsibility to treat each other with kindness and awareness as much as we can because we are sometimes more fragile than other people know. And we may not be comfortable, as the, as the song said to us, we may not be comfortable sharing what's going on with us, but sometimes we feel better when we do. So... You know, in the Old Testament, there is a story about Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel were brothers. Um, Abel was a farmer, and Cain had cattle and sheep. He had sheep. Um, and at a certain point, because they both made offerings to God, and Abel's smoke went up and turned white, and Cain's smoke went down and turned black, uh, Cain was of the impression that God liked his brother better than him. And he felt angry and hurt and jealous. So angry and hurt and jealous that he murdered his brother. So, after that, God said to Cain, where is Abel? And Cain said, basically, do I know? Am I my brother's keeper? Now, we might ask then, why? Why does God ask that? God already knows the answer to that question. He knows exactly what's happened to Abel. He knows where he is. So why would God ask Cain, where is Abel? And I don't think, bless you. I mean, I realize this story is a metaphor. It's not like this was actually literally going on. But I think in the metaphor, in the story, if we look at it from a metaphysical perspective, it's not just that God is trying to uh, shame Cain about what he's done. I don't think that's really what's going on there. I think, in a sense, that God is trying to lead this dear one to a greater understanding. And perhaps to see if Cain will own up to it, if he has the courage to own up to what he's done, perhaps to discover from what Cain's response is, um, if he realizes that what he's done isn't appropriate, isn't right. And when he lies, it's quite clear that he knows he's done wrong and that that motivation came out of that hurt, injured, jealous, wounded place. Now, that's a reflection of how much Cain wanted to be loved and didn't feel like he was. Felt like that love was given to somebody else and there wasn't enough to go around for him. The implication of it, of the story, is that yes, we are all responsible for one another. We are connected and we are our brother's keeper. Now that's a tall order because if we're all connected and we're all responsible for each other, then where are the edges of that? You know what I mean? Um, do you know who Rupert Sheldrake is? So Rupert Sheldrake was um, many years ago doing some work on what he calls morphogenetic fields, which essentially means that within any given species, there's one mind, and they're all connected in that one mind, basically. But he gives these examples, which are mind-blowing, to me anyway. 
Uh, he says, as an example, when two chemicals are caused to interact that never in the history of the world have interacted before, and they're supposed to crystallize, it often takes a very long time for them to complete the crystallization process. That's the very first time they're put together. The second time the experiment is repeated, it takes a little less time. The third time, even less, and so on, until it becomes almost automatic. So they're learning something, apparently. They're becoming familiar with the process and one another. I'm, I'm saying that as an, as an aside, as an assumption. And then he says, when these chemicals are combined for the first time in Japan and one year later in Africa and the United States, both of those second crystallization processes occur as rapidly in the United States as the last time did in Japan. How did these chemicals learn the same behavior when they're not even related resources they're just the same kind of chemicals, but they react together as quickly as the last time anywhere else. When I was first in the choir at this center in Seattle, I can remember we had a music director who was a um, writer-composer. She wasn't a singer, but she was a songwriter and composer. And I can remember her teaching us a song for the choir, and she said, you're going to have to enunciate very clearly when you sing this song because it has never been given voice like this in front of an audience before, and it will be hard for them to catch the words. About six months later, we did a choir retreat, and we invited all the congregation, anybody that wanted to come and do this part of the retreat with us to come. And at the end, we were going to perform this song together. Now, when we learned it, it took us quite a while to learn it. When we learned it with them, they learned it like that. Something happened in the consciousness between the time we were learning it and performed it and six months later when they were learning it to perform it. This is another example from Rupert Sheldrake. An experiment was done with rats in 1920 in England. After 20 generations of rats learning a particular maze, the youngest generation bred from the slowest learners were able to find their way through the maze considerably faster than the first generation was able to do. And later, rats in Australia and Scotland, rats of no relation whatsoever to the ones used in England, were put through the same maze, and they found their way through the first time as fast as the fastest rats in England. So there is an awareness, there is a learning that takes place on a, on a species-wide or maybe planet-wide or universe-wide level where the information, once it becomes available for one, is available for all. And that, I think, is mind-blowing. So when we look at there's only one, then if someone else has learned it, it's more possible for us to learn it than it was before they learned it. And for every one of us who learns something or goes forward, the next people are able to learn that or do it better or faster because of the work that we did. We build on each other that way. We grow from each other. So I think about this from the perspective of becoming an, an awakened, enlightened being, right? We talked about, or Frank was reading this morning about Jesus being a God-realized being who came into awareness of the Christ consciousness within him. And that's possible, I put that in quotes because it's not particularly simple, but it's possible for anybody living if it was possible for him. But think of how many people have come to awaken in enlightenment since Jesus and think how much easier it is for us than it was for him. And how possible that is with all of the understanding and underpinnings of this that the human race now has compared to then. It, are you with me here so far? So what this means to me metaphysically is that Every moment that we advance just a little bit, we make it easier for everybody else. Every time we're courageous and we tell the truth, even though we know it might get us into trouble, it's easier for us than it was for Cain. 
every time we choose to take a risk for love or for kindness, we make it easier for compassion to be expressed throughout the world. So when we think globally and act locally, this is really powerful globally as well. And sometimes we wait for um, somebody who has a lot of power or influence to change things so that we feel like the world is in better shape. But the, the truth is that really the power for that resides in every one of us. And as we stand for what we believe in, or we take action, or we offer kindness or support in a given moment, we make it easier for that to happen in more places in the world. So we have a lot of power as the one manifesting as many. Um, I always go back to Ram Das, you know, looking at all of us and saying, you know, this this is really just God in drag. This is the infinite expressing and dressed up as if it were the many and doing it so well that we even think we are the many. But the game is to find our way back to knowing who we are. Are you with me here? Okay. So years ago when Bill Moyers interviewed Joseph Campbell and they had that filmed conversation uh, that became the book The Power of Myth, They were talking about our connection to each other and to the earth. And Bill Moyer said, so when we say save the earth, we're talking about saving ourselves. And Joseph Campbell says, yes. All this hope for something happening in society has to wait for something in the human psyche. A whole new way of experiencing a society. And the crucial question here, as I see it, Joseph Campbell said, is simply, with what society, with what social group, do you identify yourself? Is it going to be with all the people of the planet, or is it going to be with your own particular in-group? This is the question, he says, essentially, that was in the minds of the founders of our nation when the people of the 13 states began thinking of themselves as one nation yet without losing consideration for the special interests of each of their several states. Why can't something of that kind take place in the world right now? And that's a great question. Why can't something like that take place in the world right now? I think that it can. And the challenge for us as metaphysicians, as as givers, as lovers of humanity, as those who want to love our neighbors as ourselves and remember not to leave ourselves out, is finding the boundaries. Um, Many of us in the West are not, and I don't know about in the East, but we're not great with boundaries. Um, So we either give away too much or we withhold too much. And it's hard to find the balance. I often ask in classes, are you more comfortable receiving or giving? And what do you think the answer usually is for the most, most of the people? Giving. Absolutely. Much more comfortable giving than receiving. Now that is sad because it should be, I think, a balance between giving and receiving. <clears throat> it should be an openness to both. I think that the reason we're more comfortable with giving is because when we're giving, we're in control. When you're receiving... You're not in control. And maybe we need a little less control and a little more receptivity. Because when your own cup is full, you can certainly give more out to other people. When I was a senior in high school, I had been in a play my junior year that some relatives of mine came to. And one of them had been in opera uh, when he was young. I went to a Catholic school, so there was tuition to pay, and my dad had died, my mom was a widow, and so, you know, it was squeaky, but I went in the first day of school my senior year to pay my tuition for that month. And the school secretary said to me, your tuition for this year has been paid in full. And I said, really? She said, yes. I said, my mom is not gonna like that. (laughs) And that was the truth. She called the school, 
She insisted that they tell her who it was. She was not going to accept anybody's charity. And they couldn't tell her because the person had insisted on remaining anonymous. Now, we kind of guessed that it was this uncle of mine, this adoptive uncle of mine. But we never knew for sure. But they would not take my mother's money. And it was, to me, a really clear example of... um, Uh, in later years, it was to me a really clear example of how we get to the place where we block good that is trying to come to us because in our minds we have a mental equivalent, a mental idea that that means that they think less of us or that we are to be pitied or that they're trying to um, give us some kind of charity like the poor relative and that that's shameful and therefore we shouldn't accept it. Any of you relate to that at all? right? And so many of our parents, you know, grew up in circumstances where that was what they were taught. Um, We need to be, I think, a world, if we want to create a world that works for everyone, we need to be a world that is generous and grateful. Generous in giving, receptive and grateful in receiving. You know what it's like when you give to somebody who is grudging in their receiving? It really takes the juice right out of it. And you were just trying to be, you know, connected to them through that, through that giving. But what we need to realize is that we're also connected to people through the receiving. And it is okay to say, wow, thank you. That's enough. You don't have to take on guilt or shame or fear or now I owe this. No. Receive with gratitude with graciousness so when we when we recognize yes that is where I'm supposed to be when we recognize our oneness with one another then the challenge becomes how do I treat this person in the way that I would like to be treated if this person is somebody that's already shown me that I can't trust them, how do I recognize my oneness with them? How am I generous with them in that place without becoming a doormat, without saying, well, I guess it must be okay for me to just accept what they're doing? Actually, I like this. Done right, healthy boundaries are comfort food for the soul. And not only for the one with the boundaries, but also for the one experiencing our boundaries and being called to respect those. And in the same way, it's nourishing food for us to recognize that other people around us have boundaries. It shows us their sense of self. And it allows us to treat them with that kind of respect that they deserve, not crashing through their boundaries or trying to break them down, but recognizing that's, that is a healthy balance that we're showing to each other. We may have fewer boundaries with some people, more with others, but we need to be guided to do what's appropriate for us with each one. And it doesn't mean that we don't love them. Alan Cohen wrote in his book, Rising in Love, simply assume and remember that when anyone asks for anything, they're asking for love. And then give them love, no matter what the outer request. Often, it does not matter whether we say yes or no, but how we offer the gift of our response. We can say no in a way that demonstrates complete caring and understanding of our brother or sister, and in doing so, we're actually giving an all-important yes to the person's soul which finds its fulfillment in receiving genuine love from another human being. In fact, a kind no is a much greater service than a resentful yes. For we are spiritual beings, and it is the spirit of the communication to which we respond. I used to think that I didn't want people to ask me to do stuff I didn't want to do because I couldn't tell them no, And they should know not to ask me stuff that I didn't have time to do or didn't want to do because then I have to say yes and then I have to do it and I didn't want to do it and then I feel resentful. Really? Now they're responsible for my boundaries. Like they're supposed to read my mind and know what they are? Really? Better for me to say, I'm embarrassed to say, I'm not up to 
to that. I don't have the bandwidth for it. But, you know, I appreciate your project. I love it that you're doing that. But I, I can't say yes. And sometimes, for me, it has meant going back to somebody I said yes to and saying, I have to, I have to change that agreement. I've found that I can't do it. I'm not going to be able to pull that off. And I'm really sorry to let you down, but I have to let it go. That can be a clean way of having a boundary and honoring our own personal boundaries without entering into resentment or telling people yes when we really don't mean it or we really don't want to have to say yes, but we feel like we have to. Is this making sense? Uh, Ernest Holmes in The Science of Mind said, when we find we are without friends, the thing to do at once is to send our thought out to the whole world. Send it full of love and affection. Know that this thought will meet the desires of some other person who is wanting the same thing. And in some way, the two will be drawn together. Think of the whole world as your friend, but you must also be the friend of the whole world. It's a tall order, but in essence, if we're one, we are connected to each other. Maybe we don't see each other always as friends. Um, I was thinking this morning about a friend that I'm estranged from. Uh, we became friends when we were teenagers, and we were friends for many years. And then I think, I don't know for sure what happened, but I have an idea. And then we weren't friends anymore. And this morning, I was kind of thinking about that and honoring that, that that's how it is now, and appreciating that friend and what our relationship was like for so many years and how uh, alike and connected we were, because his birthday is the same day as mine. So we're not... We're not actively friends now, but there is friend energy. And I just want to be in that instead of feeling bad about the disconnect. Just savor the friend energy that we have shared. Sometimes we walk the same path with somebody for a certain period of time, and then the paths diverge. Sometimes we have to get angry to let go of each other for the path to diverge so we can do what we each need to do. But it isn't necessary necessarily, that we get angry with each other. We could just choose to move on. So sometimes I think resentment and anger come up because we don't know how to say yes and no in a clean, loving way. Because somehow we've learned that saying no is a rejection of somebody else. But I think that's not true. I think that's not quite true. There's an Arabian proverb that says, a friend is one to whom one may pour out all the contents of one's heart, chaff and grain together, knowing that the gentlest of hands will take and sift it, keep what is worth keeping, and with a breath of kindness, blow the rest away. And so this is our job, kind of, to take and sift what's worth keeping from those that we encounter in our lives and make space for this greater love. So our practical applications, well, kind of doing random acts of kindness, I think, as a practical application, um, recognizing that we could do one small act of kindness for somebody every day. It wouldn't have to be the same person, wouldn't have to be the same thing. Just to set a goal of doing one kind thing every single day for someone else, and to be able to grow then in our ability to be thoughtful and kind. When Matthew Fox was stuttering, stuttering, no. <laughs> when he, was, when he is, was studying the work of Meister Eckhart, he wrote a book, he wrote several actually, but he wrote a book called Meditations with Meister Eckhart. And this is uh, what he wrote. Love will never be anywhere except where equality and unity are. Between a master and his servant, there is no peace for there is no real equality. And there can be no love where love does not find equality or is busy creating equality. Nor is there any pleasure without equality. Practice equality in human society. 
learn to love, esteem, and consider all people like yourself. Whatever happens to another, be it bad or good, pain or joy, ought to be as if it happened to you. And this is the reflection the universe gives back to us. That what is going on around us in joy, in triumph, in celebration, in loss or sadness. You know, I'm a movie buff. The Oscars are tonight. There are going to be more losers than winners tonight. And, and they're going to need to be able to sit there and be gracious, if they can, about somebody else winning, even though I'm sure the person who feels least likely to win is still a little hopeful that maybe. And those who really think they ought to win there's probably quite a few of them who aren't going to win tonight, right? right? And so if we, watching that, can celebrate with the winners and extend our understanding to the losers, we're somehow entering into that flow of kindness, of, of blessing those who are putting on their best face in that moment and celebrating with those who won. Now, sometimes I've thought, Gee, I wish so-and-so had won that. I think they were much more deserving of that than, than this one. I mean, that was, that was much more challenging to do than this over here. So I take my love away from the one who won? No, I don't need to do that anymore. Rumi said, out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and right doing, out beyond ideas of right doing and wrong doing. So what that says to me immediately is beyond the place where we are happy to judge and put things in categories as good or bad, right or wrong, out beyond that, there's a field. He says, I'll meet you there. And when the soul lies down in that grass, he says, the world is too full to talk about ideas, language, even the phrase, each other, doesn't make any sense. Out beyond ideas of right doing and wrong doing, this is me talking now, not Rumi, there's only one. The ideas of right doing and wrong doing are what divide us and separate us sometimes. So we have to choose from our inner wisdom to set our own boundaries and let others be about the business of setting their own and honoring those. I want to close with a story today. Uh, this was written supposedly by a guy who's a physician uh, in Denver. He says, I was driving home from a meeting this evening at 5 p.m., stuck in traffic on Colorado Boulevard, and the car started to choke and splutter and die. I barely managed to coast, cursing, into a gas station, Glad only that I would not be blocking traffic and would have somewhere warm to wait for a tow truck. The engine would not turn over. Before I could make the call, I saw a woman walking out of the Quickie Mart building, and it looked like she slipped on some ice and fell into a gas pump. So I got out to see if she was okay, and when I got there, it looked more like she had been overcome by sobs than that she had fallen. She was a young woman who looked really haggard with dark circles under her eyes. And she dropped something, and as I helped her pick it up, I gave it to her. It was a nickel. And at that moment, everything came into focus for me. The crying woman, the ancient suburban crammed full of stuff, and the three kids in the back, one in a car seat, and the gas pump reading $4.95. I asked her if she was okay and if she needed help, and she just kept saying, I don't want my kids to see me crying. So we stood on the other side of the pump from her car. She said she was driving to California and that things were really hard for her right now. So I asked, and you were praying? That made her back away from me a little, but I assured her I was not a crazy person. I said, God heard you and sent me. I took out my card and swiped it through the card reader on the pump so she could fill up her car completely. And while it was fueling, I walked next door to McDonald's and bought two big bags of food, some gift certificates for more, and a big cup of coffee. She gave the food to the kids in the car who attacked it like wolves. And we stood by the pump eating fries and talking a little. 
She told me her name and that she lived in Kansas City. Her boyfriend left two months ago and she had not been able to make ends meet. She knew she wouldn't have money to pay rent January 1st and finally in desperation had called her parents with whom she had not spoken in about five years. They lived in California and they said she could come and live with them and try and get her feet, get back on her feet there. So she had packed up everything she owned in that car. She told the kids they were going to California for Christmas, but not that they were going to live there. I gave her my gloves, a little hug, and said a quick prayer with her for safety on the roads. And as I was walking over to my car, she said, so are you like an angel or something? This definitely made me cry. Sweetie, I said, at this time of year, the angels are really busy, so sometimes God uses regular people. <laughs> it was so incredible to be a part of someone else's miracle. And of course, you guessed it, when I got in my car, it started right away and got me home with no problem. I'll put it in the shop tomorrow to check, but I suspect the mechanic won't find anything wrong. Sometimes, the angels fly close enough to you that you can hear the flutter of their wings. Simple, random act of kindness. Right where he was, the op or she was, the opportunity arose and was taken. One small act of kindness changes the universe because we're all connected. One small act of kindness that you take or that I take is then made available in the consciousness everywhere, making it easier for another one to do an act of kindness. And when we overcome an impulse to speak sarcastically, to put somebody down, to be defensive or critical, when we take that moment and take a breath and instead choose differently, we empower somebody else who's afraid to tell the truth about how they're feeling to take a breath and do that. So as I send you out uh, at the end of this February, and the, these messages about oneness and, and all of us seeking the common good, I just want to leave you with this one simple idea. You are at the point of power right now in this moment. One simple act of kindness. That's all you need to do today. And then look for another one to do tomorrow. Namaste. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, thank you. Okay. So our practitioners are coming now to surround the room for our prayer time. And I want to, usually I ask you to close your eyes or to close your eyes and put your hands over your heart. And today what I'd like you to do is as you, if you're comfortable doing this, take hands with somebody around you or reach out and touch a shoulder or if you're sitting too far away, scoot over near somebody so that you can touch someone else. And as we do this, I'm going to invite you now to close your eyes and to bring your attention first to your own heart and then to the place where you're in contact with the other person physically. The one is here. The one is unlimited. The one is the vibration of love, showing up as every other quality of life and light. That resonance is in us. We cannot be separated from it. I am knowing for each one of us right now that the resonance of the one presence is being felt in us being felt in this room and being expressed outward through us into this larger community and into the world. And as it becomes contagious, little by little, as the world lights up with love in tiny corners, cell by cell, being by being, laughter by laughter, it goes out into the universe, influencing everything there with kindness and love. 
until there is no spot where we have not uncovered the hiding place of God and found it to be us. This is happening in us now, and so we allow it. We invite it. We encourage it. We open to it. We welcome it. And we know that as God looks through our eyes, we are aware of where kindness can be given, and we give it, beginning right here in our own hearts as we give it to ourselves and beginning with the hands we hold or the beings we are touching now to extend it to them. We're deeply grateful to receive this love now, to let it in, breathing it into every cell, all the way down to our feet and sending it out in the exhale into this room and into the universe. We give thanks. We're so grateful to know this truth and to claim it and to be it. We let it go with gratitude and we just let it be. And together we say, and so it is. Yes. Thank you, Preston.